Well, hello and welcome. It is noon here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, so it's time to say good afternoon or perhaps good morning or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And it is a pleasure to welcome you today to this edition of PON Live from the Program on Negotiation at Harvard Law School. Today, PON will be featuring, featuring Hannah Riley Bowles on the all important topic of when gender matters in negotiation. My name is Nicole Bryant, and I am the Managing Director here at the Program on Negotiation at Harvard Law School. And the Program on Negotiation is a consortium between Harvard University, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and Tufts University. And as many of our regular uh, viewers and community members know, for nearly 40 years now, PON has led the world in research, curriculum development, and executive education trainings related to the topics not only of negotiation, but also mediation, and conflict resolution. And over the course of the past two years, we have been delighted to expand our reach of offering through a series of virtual PON Live events in what we've come to think of as our online classroom. So it is a pleasure to have uh, so many folks here today tuning in from all over the world. It's great to see where you're coming in from in the chat. Uh, we always love that. Thank you so much for joining us. We are honored to have you with us here over the course of the next hour. So a little word about format. For the next 40 to 45 minutes, Hannah Riley Bowles is gonna be presenting uh, her work. She will uh, at times perhaps ask questions to which you can provide a little answer or your thoughts in the chat. But at the conclusion of her presentation, we will be leaving about 15 to 20 minutes for a dedicated Q&A session. And at that time, we'd ask that you put any questions uh, that you might have in the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen that allows us to more easily filter all of the numerous questions uh, we expect and also for others uh, to weigh in if they have the same question as you do. Now this talk is being recorded and it will be posted up on the events archive at the PON website in just a few days. Um, and to that end, I'd like to thank all of the folks who are going to do, who have already done the prep work and will continue to do the post-production work on this discussion. So that's the PON events team led by Diane Long, but also Riley Shretzel and PON's Assistant Director, James Kerwin. Thanks to them for all of their work getting us to this point. And with that, I am delighted to introduce Dr. Hannah Riley Bowles, who is the Roy E. Larson Senior Lecturer in Public Policy and Management at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, where she also co-directs the Center for Public Leadership and the Women in Public Policy Program. And in addition to her role at HKF, Anna also serves on the Program on Negotiations Executive Committee, and we got the opportunity to have dinner at the Harvard Faculty Club just last week uh, for PON's latest Executive Committee meeting. Uh, and in her uh, role at PON, she also co-chaired just this year our latest Great Negotiator Award presented to Christiana Figueres of Costa Rica. I am very proud not only to be Hannah's colleague, but also amongst her biggest fans. And judging by today's turnout, I know that I'm not alone. It's a great pleasure having her with us here today. And with that, I'm delighted to hand over the virtual Zoom microphone, Hannah. Thank you very much, Nicole, for your very kind introduction and um, sense of community. I, I share it. I'm grateful to be included in your virtual classroom. Let me, let me pop up my slides. Um, I'm going to be talking today about when gender matters in organizational negotiations. This is a talk that was um, inspired by a collaboration with uh, Bobby Thomason and Inma Macias Alonso, uh, which has been actually, it's, it's come out now this year in uh, the annual review of organizational psychology and organizational behavior. And uh, Nicole is, um, or Diane is going to kindly pop that link in the chat. For you all if you want to access it it'll be available again at the end um one of the things that i want to say before i go anywhere and i welcome conversation about is that when i talk about gender i'm mostly going to be talking about men and women because that's uh where the research is that's what we know uh, most about is um the the lived experience the negotiation uh performance of people who uh, identify as men or women. Um, I would, we welcome conversations about thinking about gender minorities, about uh, intersectional LGBTQ uh, plus identities. Um, we don't have a ton of evidence. I can talk a little bit about what the newest uh, yet to be published research uh, looks like on that. 
Um, but I just wanted to acknowledge that up front and then welcome conversation or questions if anybody has any. Okay, so my objectives for our conversation are first to illuminate contextual factors that heighten the potential for gender and other intersecting identities to influence negotiation. I want to, toward the end, take these insights about how do we analyze what's going on in situations that might produce gender effects or other effects related to uh, identity characteristics of negotiators and think about at an individual level and an organizational level what we might do to mitigate unwanted effects of that character. And then finally, I want to make a call out for uh, inclusive negotiation programming, and I want to talk about some insights gained from this and related research about how we think about teaching and negotiation in ways that are um, inclusive, broadly inclusive of diverse people's lived experiences and and that are that were advice that we're giving um, uh, again meets uh, you know broadly uh, inclusive, diverse uh, negotiators. So I want to start off, this is my first opportunity, love all the messages in the chat, uh, people tuning in from all around the world, so fun. Um, I want to start off with seeing if I can get some activity in the chat. And my question is, who is the joke on in this cartoon? And while you think about that, I'm going to give you a little bit more context on this. So this is a, a, this is a single strip from a long running, many decades long running uh, Dilbert uh, cartoon series by Scott Adams. Scott Adams is actually a guy who has a business degree, I think from uh, Berkeley, Haas School of Business. And um, he's had this satire running for many decades about white collar workplaces. And in particular, he's kind of spoofing a large Silicon Valley picture um, tech engineering firm. And the main character in this series, which is translated all over the world. So even if folks are tuning in, they, they may recognize it from there. Tuning in from anywhere may recognize it from their local newspapers. It also appears in calendars and a whole variety of other spin-off products. But in this particular, uh, in this series, Dilbert is the main character. He is a MIT, he's an MIT trained uh, engineer. And um, and this is his co-worker, uh, Tina, the tech writer, who's a minor character. Uh, and and this is their pointy haired boss, who I think we can just say is kind of an evil caricature of the evil boss. And in this uh, strip here, Tina, the tech writer, says, why does Dilbert get two computer monitors? Why I only, why I only get one? And the pointy here boss retorts, well, according to researchers, is because men tend to negotiate and women don't. And she crosses her arms and says, so what happens now? And the pointy here boss replies, if I had to guess, more complaining. OK, so any thoughts in the chat on who the joke is meant to be on in this um, in this. Uh, get, let me grab my. OK. Yeah, who's the joke man? Thank you, Diane. The joke is on the boss. The joke is on the woman, Tina. The joke is on women in general. Okay, so one person says it's on the woman. She won't negotiate, but she'll complain. Seems to be dissing, complaining women. Okay, it's depressing. Yes, but we're we're going we're going to a better place. I hope. Um, the boss doesn't realize she is negotiating. He hears it as complaining. Ha, huh? I think that's a very important point. Thank you, Sheila. Um, so on the researcher, somebody highlights, I really appreciate that. I wanna come back to that. I don't see the joke. Yeah, too too depressing. On the boss and the woman on the boss. Okay, I'm gonna pause. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick up on this. So the joke may be on the woman in the sense that she doesn't appear to be a particularly skilled negotiator. She, just, she isn't necessarily following the script one might apply if one just came out of a PON executive uh, program. But but the boss is, I think, generally in this strip uh, caricatured as kind of a jerk. And and I and I think that's a great point that um, and it is consistent with the research that you know here you know, it would kind of appear like maybe when Dilbert was asking for multiple monitors, he was negotiating where when she's looking for a second one, she's complaining. 
But the one, the piece I want, what I want to do is two things. Yes, all this stuff is going on. And I want to come back to this strip actually at the end of the talk and see what else we see here. Um, but one of the things that, one of the reasons why I pulled this cartoon strip for this review was that I worried, as somebody highlighted, that the joke was also on the researchers. And a, a co-author of mine had showed me this and was kind of tickled that we'd made it, we'd made it, you know, into um, Dilbert. But I remember thinking, ouch, you know, and that I wondered to what extent, you know, the feedback from Adams was also saying, you know, you folks who research and teach negotiation have to think about how you talk about gender and negotiation because, you know, our results, yes, documenting gender differences and things like the propensity to negotiate can end up uh, reinforcing or even reifying in the sense of like creating gen you know, perceived gender differences in negotiation. And if you remember only one thing from our conversation today, I want you to remember that the gender of a person is not a reliable predictor of negotiation behavior. Gender effects are replicable. As, so as someone has published research on gender and negotiation, yes, I can get effects, I can replicate them, but I can't get effects. I don't, I don't invite men and women off the street into my lab or just go out and watch them in organizations in order to publish studies on gender and negotiation because men and women will just simply not reliably behave very differently as negotiators. Um, what does happen though with more predictability is that there are certain types of situations that trigger or uh, facilitate more gendered types of behavior in negotiation. And so what I wanna do is give you all this sense of how you would predict or diagnose or mitigate potential gender effects in negotiation by understanding those situational factors that um, are likely to heighten the potential for gender effects in negotiation. And what I also want you to, I wanna take this example of pay negotiations as an illustration. We talk so much about pay negotiations. Um, uh, we talk so much about gender negotiation in the context of pay negotiations for a couple of reasons. One, the context is very important, obviously. But two, because we get our gender effects over and over again. So we keep going back to this same well to study gender and negotiation. And as a result, and then, and then what people often will do is take these studies that are from narrow domains and then generalize them as if there are general differences between men and women and as negotiators, which are, which as I was just saying, are not as reliable. Okay. So how do we understand what are the conditions in a, in a memorable way? What are the conditions that heighten the potential for gender negotiation? So one of these factors is the degree to which gender is salient and relevant within the negotiation context. So the more salient and relevant is within the negotiation context, the more potential gender is to influence negotiations. The second factor I want you to think about is the degree of ambiguity. And that is ambiguity about like, what is negotiable here? Or how should I go about negotiating? Or how much do I really know about my negotiation counterpart? What does my negotiation counterpart understand about me? And the more foggy that picture is, the more potential people, more likely people are to rely on, you know, preconceived notions or, uh, you know, traditional norms within the environment, including gendered ones, um, to influence negotiation outcomes. So it's really this combination of factors and pay negotiations are a great example of this, okay? So pay negotiations are gendered because um, uh, pay is still associated um, with the male breadwinner, even though the structure of certainly most Western societies no longer really take the majority of households, for instance, in the United States do have two incomes coming in, um, even heterosexual couples. Um, have two incomes coming in, um, supporting uh, families. Um, the other thing though, too, is that um, money is not only associated with the male breadwinner, it's also status linked, right? And so when we associate, when we think about, you know, who are in the highest paid jobs and, and who commands within our society, for instance, like in the United States, um, men tend to be in higher paid jobs than women. So there's, it's very masculine stereotype. And there's a lot of evidence showing that pay negotiations are masculine stereotype. And then very often, there are a lot of these questions of 
what exactly can I negotiate? How do I go about it? Um, not fully understanding people's, um, you know, who are the candidates or the bosses or the needs or the context. And so as a result, these pay negotiations are often both highly gendered and ambiguous. The other thing that they're about is self-advocacy, which I'm going to talk a little bit. And self-advocacy is also um, something that's more masculine stereotype within the U.S. Um, than it is in other cultures. And I want to elaborate on that a little bit more in the moment. What I want to start off by doing is walking through. Oh, yes. Yeah, so this is my point here that I'm skipping over that I my animation is reminding me to say if we reduce the degree to which gender is, is salient and relevant within the context, and we reduce the degree of ambiguity, gender effects are likely to go away. So we're going to talk a little bit about how to do that. I want to start reviewing first, um, what are some of these um, general factors that make uh, gender more relevant and salient within a particular context? So one is culture. And um, there are some cultures that in which gender is more salient than in others, but cultural stereotypes also give shape, general cultural norms give shape to gender stereotypes. So, so um, you know, for instance, cult culture, like there are some languages that have um, masculine and feminine uh, pronouns for nouns and even often uh, noun endings. There are some cultures, languages where you, they do not gender as in English. They don't, we don't gender words. Um, so in some cultures, um, gender is just simply more salient and there's evidence showing that language makes gender more salient. But the other thing that's so interesting is that the stereotypes about men and women across cultures vary. So for instance, in patriarchal cultures, um, uh, stereotypes about men um, being more risk loving, more competitive, more assertive, um, more likely to be business leaders are much stronger than in matriarchal societies. Another example is when you compare collectivist and individualist cultures. So individualist cultures are sort of uh, indicated by these birds, um, prize, uh, you know, individual striving and competition. Whereas in collectivist cultures, people prize putting others before themselves. In individualists, what, what, what the evidence shows is that um, the stereotypes of men are typically aligned with um, the stereotypic sort of general uh, prized characteristics of a culture. So in individualist cultures, like here in the US, men tend to be stereotyped as more individualistic, competitive, assertive. In collectivist cultures though, um, men actually tend to be stereotyped as more um, collaborative and other oriented, at least when it comes to care for the in-group. So what's very interesting is that in individualist cultures where a lot of the research on gender and negotiation has come out, stereotypes tend to favor men as negotiators and particularly as competitive bargainers. And so if we set up negotiations to be very competitive, masculine stereotypes, um, you know, kind of win, lose, zero sum that we often see a, a male advantage in those types of negotiations here in the U.S. and in other individualist cultures. Really interesting, though, uh, research by uh, Vivian Shen and others has shown that um, when you go to collectivist cultures and you put men and women in a competitive bargaining situation, women are actually stereotyped to do better than the men and often um, as a result do. So the, even just the stereotypes of men and women as negotiators can be flipped across cultures. So we wanna think from a cultural perspective, one, does, does the cultural backdrop make gender more salient? And two, what is the culture, what are the uh, stereotypes about gender within the cultural context? Okay, intersecting identities are also really important because sometimes they reinforce gender and sometimes they will distract from gender, making it seem less relevant. Um, one thing that I would highlight, and this is relevant when we come back to Tina, the tech writer, is that um, you know the degree of seniority somebody has within an organization um, is often correlated with gender. So if you're in a, in a gendered context, and we'll talk about organizational culture next, but if you're in a context in which men tend to be in charge um, and women tend to be in staff roles, right, um, that hierarchy 
um, mirrors the gender status hierarchy in the sense that it reinforces the idea that men are in charge, men are the leaders, women are the supporters. And so that's an example of, say, organizational identities um, that may reinforce um, gender stereotypes. Now, interestingly, some evidence shows, for instance, that um, gender effects in negotiation may be less likely um, when women are in uh, senior executive positions than when women are in, um, uh, you know, more lower level positions, because being in that position of being an executive becomes more salient to people um, that this is an executive rather than that this is rather than the, the, this person's gender identity. And so that's what becomes most important. Now, while there is some evidence of that, there's also some really interesting studies about gender effects and executive negotiations, which I'm happy to get into. But nonetheless, it's important. What are people paying attention to? Are they paying attention? As Madeleine Albright says, you know, when she arrived on the scene, she wasn't negotiating as a woman. She was negotiating as the United States. What's the most salient thing to other people as you show up to negotiate? Other things to consider are, um, are inter intersections between gender and say race or ethnicity. Um, one of the things I think this is, this is especially important to highlight because men who are in negatively stereotyped groups, um, this might be uh, black men in the United States, uh, negatively stereotyped groups, or negatively stereotyped as workers, black men in the United States, I've done some work in the MENA region looking at negative stereotypes of uh, male nationals in the Arab Gulf, locals, as some people refer to them. Um, and the, the negative stereotyping of men, the, the effects of, of that negative stereotyping of men um, inhibits their negotiation experiences in many similar ways to the way that we see when we say women as compared to men have um, some constraints in negotiation. So for instance, black. there's a one study by Hernandez et al. showing that black men in the United States as compared to white men encountered more resistance when they attempt to negotiate for higher pay. Now that looks very similar when we look at studies of men and women writ large um, attempting to negotiate for higher pay and finding that women as compared to men tend to experience more resistance to their attempts to negotiate for higher pay, both social resistance and then resistance on the substance. Um, so when we say men versus women, we also have to be thinking about, it's really kind of privileged men is typically the, the comparison group. Um, so I think that's a really important thing to kind of keep in mind. Um, the other thing, you know, age may be a factor um, LBGTQ plus identity is something that in some contexts is very negatively, stimu uh, negatively uh, stigmatized. In other contexts, say the fashion industry um, uh, is interpreted in a very different way. So I think that, um, you know, we have to kind of think again in context, what are, you know, gender isn't always the most salient thing going on within a situation. And we have to diagnose whether or not gender is, to what extent gender is at play. Okay, organizational culture and demography, kind of like national culture, is like a backdrop that's really important. So I have illustrated here in these two slides what might be a, a male-dominated uh, bird organization versus a you know a more gender mixed uh, organization here to the right, gender diverse. When somebody is working in a relatively diverse organizational environment. Um, their uh, their their identity is just less salient because everybody is something different. In fact, I was just advising um, uh, an executive earlier this morning who was uh, thinking about identity factors within a particular negotiation, but described that everybody actually within the particular context comes from a different, it's a very multicultural environment. And so we were discussing the degree to which some of these identity factors might even be salient within the context, given the diversity of the environment. Now, when you are in an organizational environment, however, where it is, for instance, male dominated and you are fun, one of the few women, very often in male dominated organizations, you know, let's say if these lighter birds are the women, you know, there, there are often people from marginalized groups often tend to congregate in the lower ends of those organizations. It's, it's, rare that they're, you know, that the minority group is is at the top and the um, majority is at the bottom, although obviously there are structures like that. And so 
what will happen is that if you aren't part of that dominant group within the organization, your identity does stick out more. So if it's mostly dominated by men and there are relatively few women, your gender identity is going to stick out. If the organization is overwhelmingly um, white or whatever of a particular ethnic group and you don't belong to that group, again, your identity will be more, more salient than in an organizational context um, that is more diverse. Another really important factor within this is that people tend to befriend people like themselves. So it's not only that your identity might be more salient, but also if you think about friendship networks and social support networks and in the informal flow of information within organizations, those things can be also influenced by the demography of an organization. If there is a dominant group, people from that dominant group will just find it easier not only to bond with people as colleagues, but also as friends. And as a result, just may find it easier to gain access to critical information or opportunities than someone who is not from that dominant group, who might have good working relationships with people, but oftentimes people who are in minority groups within their organizations report that you know, their close advisors and friendship networks are outside of the organization. They work well with people, but the people with whom they trust and are the best friends are outside of the organization. So again, whether or not you're in the flow in of, you know, information sharing, um, informal opportunity sharing, that can also influence your negotiation outcomes. Okay, my final factor that I want to highlight in terms of what are these things that make gender more or less relevant or salient is the subject of negotiation. The subject of negotiation can be that can it can heighten the perceived relevance of gender, but it also it's important to highlight because not everything we negotiate is gendered. In fact, a lot of it isn't, right? So we've already talked about pay it being masculine stereotyped and in part because of this traditional notion of the gender division of household labor, right? Now, interestingly, whoops, um, negotiating for work family um, uh, arrangements, family-friendly work practices, access to flexible work arrangements, to parental leave, those types of negotiations because of the traditionally gender division of household labor are stereotyped as feminine. Now, and, and growing evidence shows that um, in a similar ways that women tend to encounter resistance for negotiating for higher pay, men encounter resistance for attempting to negotiate for access to family-friendly uh, work policies and practices. So, I mean, this is really interesting for a couple of reasons. One is if we'd started our journey of gender and negotiation, um, looking at gender differences and the propensity to negotiate for, say, access to leave or flexible work, you know, we might have started off saying, well, you know, men don't negotiate and women do <laughs> because, you know, the, the results are, are kind of flipped. We started off in contrast, really focusing primarily on pay negotiations. What's the other thing that's really important about this is if you, if there, if, you, if there's a couple with gender egalitarian attitudes about how they're going to raise their family and they start off and with their first kid, you know, or their second kid, you know, they find that it's easier for, uh, the mom in this heteronormative um, family that I'm socially constructing, if it if if the if it's easier for the mom to negotiate for access to um, flexible work policies, family friendly policies, and it's easier for the dad to negotiate for higher pay, that couple, um, no matter what their starting plan of how they're going to divide the labor, may end up in a more traditional relationship as a result of the way that they interact with work organizations. Really importantly, one of the things that I want to emphasize is that I've done research now for um, 10 or 15 years interviewing uh, managers and executives about what do they actually negotiate at work, and particularly in relation to their career or their leadership advancement. And overwhelmingly, these managers and executives recount role negotiations. Um, this, is, this is so important. It is men and women equally. Men are more likely than women to recount pay and job offer negotiations. Women are more likely than men to recount uh, work family, trying to deal with uh, work family conflicts. Uh, but um, role is the overwhelming topic for negotiation. And there's 
we, I have not observed any gender differences in the propensity to kind of work out what are your assignments, you know, um, uh, whatever, you know, what are, what are your, your professional aspirations, a whole variety of things that people uh, negotiate with regard to their roles. This is also super, super important because if you look at the gender pay gap, um, I think gender negotiation, gender pay negotiation is a really important topic. The gender pay gap is much more about occupation, gender differences in occupational advancement than it is about differential pay in the same job. And so even if all you care about is closing the gender wage gap, really the focus should be on trying to get women up um, into uh, more into positions of higher authority and pay. Um, that would make a I, I that would have a more impactful difference um, than just trying to close uh, gender differences in how people are compensated in the same job. So role negotiations are really important. They are not as gendered. We should put a lot of emphasis in that area. Now, role negotiations could be gendered in some ways, and I'm happy to talk about that. But in general, um, they're less gendered than pay or work family. Okay, so we've been we've been talking thus far about how um, what are those kind of situational factors that heighten the relevance and salience um, of gender within a context. What I'd like to talk about next is ambiguity. What difference does ambiguity make? Um, it's these factors that make gender and negotiation, gender and negotiation more relevant and salient um, that, that kind of shape the form of what gender effects we get in negotiation. But ambiguity is like a facilitator of those effects. So let's talk about ambiguity about what is negotiable. What is negotiable here? What evidence shows um, from experiments, but also what are called meta-analyses, statistical analyses of patterns in um, scores of negotiation studies. What, the result, what those results show is that gender differences in negotiation outcomes are significantly greater when the parties are not exactly clear about what does the zone of possible agreement look like? And that can happen for a couple of reasons, particularly in a very negatively, not negatively, excuse me, in a, in a, in a negatively stereotyped negotiating domain for women, in a masculine stereotyped negotiating domain. People just might imagine that men are going to be better negotiators than women. Um, men might go in with more optimistic expectations. Their negotiating counterparts may imagine they have to make more concessions to them. So that's one reason why, when it's not exactly clear what the standards for a negotiation could be, that ambiguity about what can make a difference. Another factor goes back to those social networks that I was talking about, right? So if you're in an organizational context where men tend to, for instance, be paid more than women or get certain types of opportunities more often than women, um, and uh, and then men talk to men about what they should be negotiating and women talk to women about what they should be negotiating, their advice networks could give them different expectations about what is potentially negotiable. So we really want to, when I um, coach people or do training, we really emphasize how do you help people understand with clarity what is negotiable? And what the research shows also is that when men and women have a clear sense of what it is they should be going after, gender differences are much less likely. Okay, another source of ambiguity is how to negotiate. Like, what? how do I go about this? The, the best evidence shows that gender differences in pay negotiations are explained by the resistance that women are more likely to encounter as compared to men when they self-advocate for higher pay. So there's research showing that um, negotiating for assertively for higher pay um, for yourself can make um, uh, women seem like they're not team players, like they don't care enough about organizational relationships. And as a result, people will report um, if they're randomly assigned to see a woman who attempted to negotiate for higher pay or one who just let the negotiation pass, that woman who negotiated, they report, um, you know, they're a little, I'm a little less likely to want to work with her. I'm not sure how much I would benefit or enjoy working with her. So that's a, if that's the case, if there's a greater social risk for women than for men of attempting to negotiate for higher pay, it's quite reasonable for women to be more hesitant to assert themselves. They realize, um, intuitively or consciously that this is a trickier situation that I have to work out. There are good strategies and I'll get to that in the end. Um, 
What the evidence shows, though, is that when men and women have clarity about what the negotiating norms are, that hesitation on the part of women tends to go away, and um, and they have and there's they have a kind of equal or comparable propensity to attempt to negotiate. Now, really interesting. Going back to stereotypes, this is really about self advocacy because um, you know, at least in individualist cultures, we um, we the the ideal feminine stereotype is of people who put others before themselves. And so what research in the US shows is that while um, people might uh, socially penalize or say they don't like as much a woman who's very self-assertive asking for things for herself, they actually also don't like it when women aren't assertive enough on behalf of others. And they love it when women are assertive negotiators on behalf of others. So even just switching, whether you're negotiating for yourself or negotiating for somebody else, um, makes a difference. I, I, that, that's, that was work that I did a, a long time ago and then others have subsequently re replicated. And I think it's one of those important examples of how this is really about context, this gender stuff. It is not so much about some sort of individual permanent, like a uh, persistent or uh, personality-based difference between men and women. Okay. Um, so we want to get clarity about what are the negotiating norms? How should I go about this? And then finally, clarity about who the negotiating parties are is very important because the less we know about somebody, the more we might rely on stereotypic assumptions to judge what are their interests or what are their goals. And so we have to be careful about this for ourselves when we're working with others. Am I making assumptions about what somebody else wants based on demographic characteristics, based on superficial things that I know about them? Um, could other people, though, also make assumptions about me based on my, uh, you know, based on superficial identity characteristics about me? For instance, you know, uh, a woman might not want an overseas assignment because she's not going to want to travel or won't be able to bring her family or he's going to really want a lot of money. We're going to have to, you know, really figure out how to pay this guy you know, um, we can, the more lack of clarity there is about one person relative to another, the more that we're, we're, we're going to rely on our subjective judgments and the more potential there is for stereotypes to come into play. Okay. So we've talked about this framework of two factors. We want to analyze the situation to say how relevant and salient is gender within this context? How ambiguous are things here? What's really great is that if we can reduce the degree of ambiguity or reducing the degree of the salience and relevance of gender, we can do by, for instance, being uh, creating more diverse organizational cultures and things like that, um, making people's professional identities more salient than other factors. Um, but the other thing that we can do very importantly is reduce ambiguity uh, because that uh, that will reduce, the, even in even in very gendered contexts, that will reduce the likelihood of gender effects. So we only have, I want to make sure we get enough time for Q&A, but can I highlight, just going back to the, back to the chat, what are maybe some things that you see going on here that, um, that what are, what are some contextual factors that we should take into account when we are analyzing whether this is what's going on in terms of gender and negotiation in this cartoon? So for instance, like what type of organizational context is this? I don't know if people are gearing up to add some things to the chat. Maybe I'll do a giveaway while I wait for some comments. Um, so one thing, male dominated, got this, male dominated business office. It's actually tech. There are power dynamics. Dilbert is an engineer and Tina is a tech writer. So somebody could say, independent of gender, we give engineers because they are they contribute more directly to our bottom line, more technology than we give the staff tech writers because we think that that's an appropriate investment. Um, also, you know, age, it matters. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. They're probably in corporate culture is likely to be male dominated. This might look really different if um, if these characters, and maybe particularly Tina, were a much older person or a much younger person. They're also white. They self-represent as um, cis hat. They, um, you know, there's a whole variety of things. The clothes, Western, there's right Western context. There's a whole variety of things that are going on here 
that if we really wanted to assess whether this is just simply about gender, um, you know, we'd have to um, uh, we have to dig in a little bit. One other thing that I want to highlight here on ambiguity, she doesn't understand why Dilbert gets two monitors and she only gets one. So there's clearly a lack of clarity within the organization with regard to how these types of resources are allocated. And this could be a very different conversation if this was an organization where these types of norms were made more transparent, or there was at least a mechanism for asking about how does one pursue these types of resources. Okay. So suggestions for individuals, I'm going to go through these quickly, and then I'm really excited to um, engage with Nicole and, and your questions. So individually, what would I advise? Develop your negotiation skills. Um, what evidence shows is that following what is really classic PON, executive programming advice, explain why your proposals are legitimate, come up with mutually beneficial negotiation solutions, that isn't just general, generally really good negotiation advice. We've also tested in numerous experiments that those strategies, that combined strategy, also helps to overcome some of these, for instance, risks of backlash for women self-advocating for higher pay. This is it. It um, th this is this stuff that PO. You know, I'm not I'm not just selling this. I've been part of this community for 20 years or something. There's really a ton of evidence showing that this this these mutual gains negotiation approaches. Um, are are really the uh, have enormous benefits, and then particularly for folks who are at greater risk of social backlash. I think the other thing to do is to strengthen your identity as a negotiator, right? So research shows, for instance, that you know we can be made um, subtly aware of negative stereotypes um, linked to our identity. So, for instance. Um, the idea that men will be better bargainers, competitive bargainers in a particular context than others. But some research has shown that um, highlighting, even if only in your own mind, other positive stereotyped aspects of your identity as a negotiator can help mitigate those potential influences of negative stereotypes associated with gender. So for instance, you know, I am a well-trained um, you know, lawyer uh, or business person or diplomat or whatever, you know, I'm someone who's done a lot of executive training or whatever in negotiation. Those things are, can actually boost your, get you into the right mindset heading into a negotiation. And then finally, really important, super important, reduce the ambiguity about what is negotiable, how to negotiate and who is negotiating. Um, for organizations, reduce ambiguity, make more transparent, not just through informal um, networks, or if it, if, it's, if it has to be informal, make sure that there are chief talent officers or other organizational leaders who are making sure that everybody can get information they need on what is negotiable, how to negotiate, and then also thinking about talent assessment and networking processes so folks get to know each other um, uh, more deeply and thoroughly throughout an organization. And then, you know, best practices suggest collecting data to assess and address inequality and negotiated outcomes. A lot of organizations, these inequalities are not like, they're not like spread like peanut butter throughout organizations. There are certain contexts where, for instance, a, you know, gender stereotyped roles, lots of subjectivity and managerial decision making. You'll be more likely forms of pay that are more up to subjective discretion, like gender differences of pay are more likely to appear in bonuses than salary or in sort of unusual compensation packages rather than standard packages. Um, you have to kind of look within your organization and see if stuff is going on. And um, and laws like in Massachusetts support the idea of go in and figure it out and then do something about it. Don't worry about not finding these things. Finally, just for educators, I'll, I want to just go quickly. I think it's really important that we contextualize negotiation training and education, that we take into account what are identity factors that might influence negotiation um, through the cases, examples. This is one um, uh, with the support of the uh, Women in Public Policy Program at the Harvard Kennedy School. I've created this Negotiate Well case collection that has some of the information that we've been discussing today, along with other cases. Um, I think the other thing that's really important is it's very beneficial if you're running negotiation training, say for women, or I do some stuff with um, college students in tech and engineering from historically marginalized background. How are you helping them figure out what is negotiable, how to negotiate, and to reduce some of also, you know, potential stereotyping about who the negotiators are? And then finally, what seems to be critically important 
um, in uh, negotiations, uh, particularly, I mean, really, I think any negotiation training, but I've seen it very profoundly influential in negotiations, women's leadership development, or sometimes with other historically mar marginalized groups that you create communities of learning and support. Participants in a negotiation training program can be, or leadership development more broadly, can be so supportive to one another. They learn so much from one another. They create those networks of information sharing and advice in ways that are just very empowering and meaningful. So I think that's the final thing that I would highlight. All right, let me start stop there. Diane is going to throw some of these links in the chat. Uh, I welcome you to join us for a seminar series that we've had going, looking at gender and intersectional perspectives and negotiation, and including some um, YouTube videos of past sessions. And so all this will be linked uh, in the chat. Nicole, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Hannah. And I know we have uh, a lot of questions, but let me just start by saying what a, what a fascinating discussion. Uh, you know, I, I'm going to start by asking, when when you talk about the barriers to negotiating well, that also assumes that people want to negotiate. And I was wondering if there's been any research done on um, perhaps women's reluctance sometimes to engage in a negotiation at all. Um, I've heard numerous people say, oh, I, I, I don't do that. So we're not even at how to define the ZOPA, how to make sure that there is um, an understanding of what can be negotiated, but just the fact that negotiating is important and a necessary part of uh, uh, is is there anything that is um, that has been done on that sort of barrier to entry even into the process? So that is a wonderful question, and I think that um, you know there is a stereotype of negotiation, just the word negotiation, that invokes you know people in pinstripe suits bargaining competitively across the table, or you know people negotiating for higher pay. And a failure to realize as we study and teach about it, that negotiation is everywhere. You know, I mean, we, we negotiate with our household partners, with our work colleagues all the time. It, it's really about just finding mutually beneficial solutions when there's some sort of potential conflict or trade-off that needs to be resolved. And so sometimes people say, well, I don't do that, but it comes from a place of saying, I'm not one of those competitive bargainers. I'm a problem solver, but that's not, I'm not a competitive. So, so I think some of it is just embracing the word or the behavior, you know, and realizing that. I think one of the most profound lines that I heard lately um, about why negotiation training was really eye-opening, and that was somebody saying, well, you know, I just didn't even realize I had choices. And so I think that's another big eye-opener when you're working in negotiation with women. Um, and then particularly, I've been doing more stuff lately with women from like really marginalized backgrounds. So so women in, um, I work, I've worked a lot with a lot of high powered women too, but um, the, you know, just realizing that, okay, if I can think about a solution, if I'm thinking about this problem, not just in terms of what I want, but in terms of the what the other person wants. And if I can find a solution that's gonna fix their problem as well as mine, you know, that that's that, that I'm that I'm 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 helping both of us. You know, I mean, I think I think that frame is so critically important. And that also goes back to this evidence showing that the likelihood of backlash is reduced if you explain in a way that they understand why what you're asking for is legitimate. And then you explain that you've taken their interests into account. I mean, both of those things are really important. So. So, yes, I, I understand that. Uh, reaction, I can sympathize with it. Some people, it's just a matter of personality, and that's fine. But, but, but I think actually, there's also really old evidence showing that people are more actually. If you refuse to negotiate because you say, on principle, I don't want to be a competitive bargainer, I don't want to fight with you, people actually think you're being obstinate <laughs> and are more likely to walk away. They're expecting some give and take from you. They're actually expecting you to be curious about their interest to come yeah. up with an agreement. So, so I think that it's it's really a frame of mind type of thing. Thank you for asking this. Super yeah, important. Well, and I, I hope that PON is contributing to that in a way, yeah. of bringing you know opportunities for people to learn and you know normalize the idea of negotiation. Um, we have a question from Michael who, who's saying, you know, I've been working for 40 years in HR, employment law, and I've heard kind of, you know, versions uh, of the effects of gender over time. Is there anything that's shifted? Do, do you see any signs of movement, positive, negative, I'm not going to pause it, um, in the course of the research that you've been doing that would indicate that gender effects are changing to one extent or another? 
So I think there is definitely much broader awareness of these effects. So I think that's absolutely the case. I think that when I look at, say, data from graduating professional students, there isn't some big gender difference in the propensity to negotiate offers. Um, uh, I mean, that's a relatively privileged group, you know, but I don't see a lot. I don't, I don't see big difference. I, I, I mean, the, the, just to be clear though, this, some of these effects have really been replicated in a lot of places. Um, so I'm not, I'm not saying it's all gone away, but I think there's definitely with growing awareness of the dynamic, I think some of these differences are changing. Um, um, that said, like in one study that I'm thinking of, we didn't find any gender difference in the propensity to negotiate for higher pay, but we did see women reporting more resistance to their attempts to negotiate for higher pay than for men. So I don't think the effects have gone away altogether. I think things are improving. I think the, the increased transparency thing is really important. I think that's one of the most important things that organizations are increasingly doing around this gender and diversity stuff more broadly to just kind of improve their systems. And with improved systems, I think you do definitely also see progress. I, I think the other big shift that's that's coming along is greater recognition of the challenges also for men from historically marginalized groups. And I think it's really important that we don't say, you know, like, uh, you know, men, simply men versus women, when men from historically marginalized groups are experiencing a lot of the same. Like if you, you look at the gender, the, the excuse me, the, the wage gaps in the United States, the gap between, for instance, black men, and white men, uh, full paid, full time workers is is greater than the gap between um, uh, black and white women, uh, full time workers. You know, what I mean, like we, we just we can't we can't just think about this in a binary way. We have to think about this from an intersecting perspective. But again, even just these labels, male, female, white, black, are binary, and I recognize that. But nonetheless intersectionally, it's really important that we start thinking about these things intersectionally. Right. Or even as you'd mentioned, men negotiating on work-life balance questions. Yeah, like, exactly. The context, the context really matters. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Hannah, I, we have a question also on, it, it does the, so if an employee is negotiating with the boss, as in that example with Tina and the pointy haired boss, does the um, gender of the uh, supervisor have any impact on the outcomes? In, oh, Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, the data aren't really good on that. And in general, it, across not only negotiation, but a whole variety of other realms. I mean, the thing about stereotypes, it's not a battle of the sexes. That's really important to recognize. It's that we all kind of within our cultural context, we have these um, stereotyped assumptions that we just kind of get used to. You know what I mean? I, like, I think that when people are, they say, I don't want to work with a woman who just negotiated assertively. I don't think they're consciously deciding, I don't want to work with women who negotiate. I just think it's sort of, they get this kind of like, oh, that's not what I'm used to, or that's not kind of what I grew up with. Or when I've tried to do that in the past, I've gotten pushed back on. So I, I think that no, the data aren't clear that like men are the problem versus women. It's the, these sort of generally held stereotypes. Yeah. Great. Um, we have a question from um, Damien asking, is there research at all on the effect of, and framed as in quotes, because wondering if this is the correct term, like a degree of genderness. So do more masculine or oh, yeah. um, in a stereotypical, you know, heteronormative sense. You um, know, that's you an such an interesting question. So there isn't a ton of data on that, but there's, for instance, some really interesting research looking at facial structures. So people, a more oval face is more feminine stereotypic. I mean, I'm, I'm simplifying the research, but a more oval face is more feminine stereotypic and a more kind of square face with a strong jaw is more masculine stereotypic. And men with more masculine stereotypic facial structures actually get competed with more. People think they're going to be more competitive. So like there isn't really good evidence on testosterone and hormones and how that changes, but it does seem like people who look more stereotypically masculine, people may expect to be more competitive, more masculine stereotypic, and therefore people act more masculine stereotypic toward them. You know, I can imagine, and I don't know that we know this, that people, you know, a, a person who self-presents as very feminine might be, you know, people might expect that person to be very cooperative and agreeable and then experience like an expectancy violation if they don't act like that. Um, there's also interesting research looking at, it depends on context, right? 
So there's interesting research, for instance, showing that within the, at least this kind of predates some of the, the Trump, current Trump dynamic, but, but in data that predated the Trump dynamic, what they found was that like for Republican women or women in the Republican party, actually having a more feminine facial structure was actually predictive of women's political success, but not in Democrats. So not in the Democratic party where the, the, the Republican party has historically kind of embraced more traditional gender roles. And so when you, it, it would appear that when you conform more to that, um, that, that may, maybe that's more rewarded or accepted when you conform more to gendered stereotypes in a in a culture that is that embraces traditional gender roles in in a culture that's more progressive or um you know i don't know agnostic inclusive about those things then your then the traditional appearance doesn't matter as much i could actually go on and on and on <laughs> about this there's also stuff intersecting with race where um there's some evidence showing that uh, you know, it may help black men to appear more baby faced and less threatening. Mm -hmm. um, whereas for white men appearing more masculine is more rewarded. Um, and then in order to kind of temper the sort of perceived aggressiveness of black men. So, so this really does matter. Um, it, it, it's a really good question. It's not, yeah. not just simple as binary. Yeah. Um, thank you. We have a couple of questions that are on the theme of sort of naming the game, as we'd say in negotiation, and and if that can provide backlash when you're talking about the effect of gender on negotiation. So starting off by saying, I know I'm a woman, so you might take this, or, you know, I know I'm a man and uh, and, and whatever. Have you looked at that um, and its effects? Oh, I have never d done a study on this, but I have had numerous women say to me that they take the research on backlash and they say, you know, there's this research that there's backlash against women who self-advocate. I know you would never do that. <laughs> so I'm going to lay, let me lay this out for you. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't, I don't know empirically whether that would work. You know, if you did it, you know, a hundred times on average, that would work better than some other ways. <laughs> um, but isn't that fun? It's kind yeah. of fun. I mean, I, I, I think it's, I think, Yeah. I mean, I think it's good. I think, I think particularly if you can do it with humor or uh, th another thing on, on um, reducing ambiguity, I think people are very responsive when you show them data, you know? And so if you can really go in and say, this is why I'm looking at this. And if you think there's some sort of inequality, just say, this is what I'm seeing. Can you help me understand this? Um, I think that that's, that can be effective. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, we, we have a question. I know that this could probably be the object of an entire talk, but do you have any research uh, to point to about folks who are on uh, either non-binary or transgendered and that effect on negotiation? Um, so um, there's one, I think there are literally only two studies that are not yet to be published that I know of. Um, uh, um, there's one study led by um, Megan Tusi, and, and she was looking at what um, effect does it have if you're negotiating with someone who presents, I believe it was, as non-binary? And what she found was no effect for young people, but a a kind of a, a but some sort of negative or avoidance effect uh, with older generations, which is kind of interesting. It's just one study. It, it's still a research in process. There's another study that I think is closer to publication that looks at to what extent, if we know somebody is um, gay or lesbian, do we then stereotype them um, in some heteronormative way? So if you're a man who loves men, do we assume that you're more feminine? You're more like a woman. If you're a woman who loves women, do we assume that you are more like a man? And so there's some evidence of stereotyping lesbian women as more competitive than straight women and gay men as more co cooperative than you know straight men but th this research is really nascent um and that's work by um Sridhari Desai and colleagues I want to make sure I call that out because it's still in process it was on a PON live it was too. on and there's yeah exactly yeah I talked with Sridhari on um that was on uh the the impacts of heels at work and uh and whether that uh, yes. yeah and the influence uh, on that okay great thank you so much for that Hannah well, listen, we're almost at time, everyone. I know that um, I could keep going with Hannah for a very long time. I'm really delighted, Hannah, that you accepted our invitation. Um, this has been a, a long time coming to want to get you to PON Live. And thank you so much also for all of those really sort of practical tips. So when this
this recording goes live on our site, you will be able to view all of Hannah's slides, right? There were some concrete suggestions that she had for how you could um, improve uh, outcomes in negotiation. And one of those, of course, was to just be more informed about basic negotiation skills. So to that end, uh, to wrap up, I'll talk a little bit about what else we are um, you, uh, coming up with at PON. Um, so we have two PON live events coming up in November, Alexandra Vokru on Ukraine, and then Stevenson Karlbach on the idea of influence. So we look forward to seeing this group here again. If you want to go further and take a training with us, um, we would love to see you at our negotiation and leadership uh, upcoming intensive in December or at a brand new virtual uh, program that we're launching in January called Negotiation Essentials Online. Uh, and so that you can hone those negotiation skills and uh, and continue to be more effective. Hannah Riley Bowles, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Thank you to all of our participants and the PON staff. And we look forward to seeing you soon.